This is the time to worship God. This is the time to sing his praise. This is the time to pray to him. This is the time to hear his word. This is the time to show your love for him. We worship God in our first hymn. Come, worship God who is worthy of honour. Come together with our prayers. Let us pray. We gather, God, for you have called us. Meeting in this building or gathered around a screen as we worship you. We bring our excitement and our hope. We bring our <coughs> memories and expectations. We bring our anxieties, our disappointments and our successes and we share them together with you. For you have called us. You have called us to be your people. You have called us to know your love and forgiveness. You have called us in Jesus Christ to be human beings to the full of our extent. So we come in worship now and offer you our words and our music, our quiet and our conversation, our fellowship, and then we prepare to be your people once more as we separate. As we come together, as we pray together, God, we remember too that uh, things are not always as they should be. Sometimes we let ourselves down by what we do and what we say. Sometimes we are not fully aware of what we're doing that impacts others. Sometimes we forget 
that you call us to be your people in praise and worship and service. So part of our coming together, God, is to recognize our weaknesses and hear once more your word of forgiveness and renewal. For you are a God who journeys with us through the good times and through difficult, through triumph and tragedy, through despair to hope. So gather us into worship as we hear you speaking to us once more. And as we respond, so we share together in the words that Jesus gave to his disciples to pray. Loving God in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Good morning. Sorry, multitasking this morning. Um, huge welcome to everybody. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you to those who are online and those who will watch later. And thank you very, very much for the Reverend Stephen, to Stephen Copson, who's come today to speak and to lead our service of worship, which I think he's done on many bank, August bank holiday weekends. So thank you very much for coming again, Stephen. A huge welcome to you. Um, the notices are the, um, the only one I can remember <laughs> is that uh, there's an online home group meeting this Wednesday at 7pm and Tommaso is the sort of host of it and an instigator behind it. I know that Simon is helping uh, lead this one, Simon our minister, um, and um, I think it begins at 7pm. To get the link for it you need to email either Simon or Libby, or if you know his email address, Tommaso himself. But um, if you're online and you want to join that, um, do try and reach out to, uh, through the website or to Simon to find out about this Wednesday, 7 p.m. online home group. We'll have coffee afterwards, so do stay and um, join, getting to know each other through that and bring your coffee in here. Um, and I think that's about it. What else should I say? Yes, no, welcome, thank you very much. Okay, so um, we're going to um, pray for our church giving. Do you, are you going to doing that or should I just do that since I'm here? As I'm here. So let us pray. Father, we thank you for all the resources that you give us. We thank you, Lord, for each other. We thank you for the uh, giving that comes through the banking systems. We ask that you'd help us to use it to your glory and for the coming of your kingdom. And we ask your blessing upon your church, this church, your church, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh yes, I just wanted to add that the, as our ministers are away, either at Greenbelt or I'm not sure um, if Dawn's on holiday, but so yes, that's Hence, we're low in numbers and uh, it's, it's August. But hopefully next week, with September, we'll get going again. But now I'll hand back to, well, I think I'm going to hand to Margaret to do the reading, our first reading. Thank you, Margaret. The first reading comes from James chapter 2, verses 14 to 17. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but does not have works? Surely that faith cannot save, can it? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, 
is dead. Thank you, Tim, for your welcome. It's a, a pleasure and a joy to be with you again. Um, I haven't quite got the, the tradition that um, the proms and uh, Notting Hill Carnival do, but I'm, I'm gradually racking up my year-on-year -year visits here. Thank you for asking me still. And we think of Simon and Liz basking in the sunshine at Greenbelt. We're going to sing our second hymn now, When the Church of Jesus Shuts Its Outer Door. <laughs> Now we have our reading from the Old Testament. This reading is from Ruth chapter 3. A little bit of a backstory. Naomi and her daughter in law Ruth, both of whom are now widows, have recently returned to Naomi's hometown and after some years away. So, Naomi and her mother-in-law said to Ruth, Naomi, her mother-in-law said to Ruth, my daughter, I need to seek some security for you so that it may be well with you. Now here is our kinsman Boaz, with whose young women you have been working. See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Now wash and anoint yourself and put on your best clothes and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, observe the place where he lies. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. Ruth replied, all that you say I will do. Ruth went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had instructed her. When Boaz had eaten and drunk and was in a contented mood, 
he went to lie down at the end of a heap of grain. Then Ruth came stealthily and uncovered his feet and lay down. At midnight, the man was startled and turned over, and there, lying at his feet, was a woman. He said, who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your cloak over your servant, for you are next of kin. He said, may you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. This last instance of your loyalty is better than the first. You have not gone after young men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, do not be afraid. I will do for you all that you ask. For all the assembly of my people know that you are a worthy woman. But now, though it is true that I am your near kinsman, there is another kinsman more closely related than I. Remain this night, and in the morning, if he will act as next of kin for you, good, let him do it. But if he is not willing to act as next of kin for you, then, as the Lord lives, I will act as next of kin. Lie down until the morning. So she lay at his feet until morning, but got up before one person could recognize another, for he said, it must not be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. Then he said, bring the cloak you're wearing and hold it out. So she held it and he measured out six measures of barley and put it on her back. Then he went into the town. She came to her mother-in-law who said, how did things go with you, my daughter? Then she told her all that Boaz had done for her, saying, he gave me these six measures of barley. For he said, do not go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. She replied, wait, my daughter, until you learn how the matter turns out. For the man will not rest, but will settle the matter today. Some of you, I guess, will recognize the name of Barbara Cartland, the novelist. She is in the Guinness Book of Records as being the most prolific novelist, having authored 723 novels in her writing career, and having sold something like 750 million copies of her books. The plots follow broadly the same line. Boy meets girl, girl meets boy, girl and boy fall in love, there is problems, but thankfully everything comes good in the end and they are married and live happily ever after. The prose is something like, he looked down into the limpid pools of her eyes, or he clutched her to his manly chest, that sort of thing, you get the idea. It is tempting for us to read Ruth as if it were a romance, straightforwardly. Ruth, where love conquers all, the girl from the wrong side of the tracks finds her man and is married, and as uh, you read in the postscript, uh, down the line you get David, and further down the line you get Jesus. They overcome the barriers of difference. But it's not quite a romantic story. The editor, because the events that are being described here take place some hundreds of years before the actual writing down of the story, the editor draws upon this old story within the people of Israel, not because they like to see romance in their sacred scripture, because it tells them something about themselves. The editor draws upon the story not to fulminate like a prophet, nor to offer a sermon,
but a morality tale. To hold up a mirror that in the reading of the story, people would see themselves and their time, as indeed we have that same opportunity to look and reflect. And if you read through the book, which is not very long, you will see it is both perceptive and incisive and invites us in to say what is going on here that we need to learn about. I say that because actually when you work through it, the points it makes are blindingly obvious. But maybe that is also the point that the editor needed to point out what was blindly obvious because people did not see it as such. What does it mean to live in a godly aware community together? We heard some of the background in the reading that uh, Naomi and her sons had left Israel at a time of famine to go and seek somewhere where there was food and shelter. And her two sons had gone with her and they had settled in Moab. I think there is probably something of the writer's license in this because Moab, I understand, is about 1,800 miles from Bethlehem. So it'll be quite a journey. They settle down. The sons marry Moabite women and conveniently die for the benefit of the story. And then the famine strikes Moab and Naomi decides it's time to go back home. One daughter-in-law says, I wish you well, but I'm going to stand, stay here. And the other says, I will go where you are. I will belong where you belong. And this is Ruth. Ruth, the center of the story. So, who is Ruth as they travel back to Bethlehem? Ruth is a foreigner, Ruth is a stranger, Ruth is an outsider. She comes from a country where it would have been known there would be a mixed history of conflict and amity depending on the years that they went by. We might reflect that the editor is writing at a time when the Israelites have moved back from captivity into the devastation of the land and they're saying what are we going to make of our community we remember the history what's the future going to be like who are these people living where we used to live what is our relationship to them we can see this reflected in the old testament where the israelites ask questions about their neighbors and about those which they meet who are not israelites Sometimes there's a degree of latitude for them. Perhaps when times were good and there was uh, nothing so much to fear. Others, there are times of weakness when they double down on their identity and do not want to have anything to do with those who are not like them. Sometimes there are periods of anxiety and threat where anything, including mass murder, seems to go. Ruth is also an economic migrant. She and Naomi leave because there is more food in Israel than there is in Moab. One can't help thinking that were she to approach England today, she would be on the first bus back to Moab. But there you go. Ruth then holds up a picture of the possibility of the integration of those who are not, who are foreigners or strangers or outsiders, of offering respect to people who are different, of welcoming those who come in need. There is a process which we call othering, which is present probably since people got on, which is saying, um, this is me and this is them. These are my group and that's their group. Othering sets people apart, divides into us and them. 
a perennial feature perhaps of human activity, of identity, of who we are by gathering with those who are like us. The question comes, how do people cross those spaces that are created between them and us? What are they filled with? Is it mischief or indifference or prejudice that marks us off from one another or welcome and trust and affirmation of people as different but belonging? Ruth is a very hopeful book because it holds out the possibility of people belonging where they thought they did not belong before. It does not take much to look in the modern headlines to see evidence of uh, a fear of strangers, of lazy stereotypes dividing us and them, worthy and unworthy, good and bad, polarizing a power that makes divisions toxic rather than things to be embraced. A vision of harmony seeks to break through the cynicism. Secondly, and equally obviously, Ruth is a story about women. Women at the centre stage. And we have to think how rarely that appears in the Old Testament. Think of the only other book that is named after a woman and it is Esther. And you will know that Esther famously doesn't mention God at all. The Old Testament was a male dominated world. Kings and prophets, priests and warriors. As the great rhythm and blues singer James Brown said, it is a man's world. But here the main characters are women. Women, indeed, who are vulnerable, but women too who are resourceful and work out their own path through life. When we read that third chapter, um, I wonder how it, how it struck you as you read through it or heard it read. Naomi is a wise, you might say a cunning woman, who plays the cards as best she can and lives by the rules that are set by her in a male-dominated world. What do you think of her advice? Which is, in short, Ruth, get dressed up, get into bed with this man you've hardly met but who's very kind, and see what happens. It sounds a little strange, doesn't it, when you put it like that? I leave it to the biblical scholars to work out precisely what the words mean, but surely there is something going on here. Naomi is willing to play upon the sense of honour that Boaz has, his sense of kinship, even though in doing so she risks, as Ruth does, risks being seen as the wrong sort of woman. Your minds, I'm sure, will flick through to the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew, that part we rarely read at Christmas because it's full of begats. And in that list of begats, there are four women. You will doubtless recall them. There is Tamar, there is Rahab, there is Ruth, and there is Bathsheba. Each one in their story, there being something not quite fitting right, how people saw these women. Naomi and to some extent, uh, very much Ruth, face a stark choice. They either find a way to get on with living or the options are being a beggar or possibly even a prostitute. Hard choices to which Naomi navigates an answer. Nowadays, of course, we do well to applaud and laud the achievements of women. how they are allowed, how they have made a way in the world, even when the odds were stacked against them. And yet we see day by day plenty of evidence where women still struggle across the world and within our own nation. 
Denied the right to go out without a male partner. Denied the right to education. Not going as far in employment as you would think. Not always given full human rights. Objectified as sexual objects. Subject to violence and a general discrimination that comes from the expectations of others. How often we hear the complaint that for a woman to get on, it means she's not acting ladylike. I don't think Naomi was acting in a particularly ladylike way. If this is possible with half the population, think how other minorities are treated in the world and not so far from us too. Thirdly, there is a safety net. Boaz seems to be a nice guy, if at times a bit dim. He wakes up and finds a woman in his bed. And what does he do? Well, he congratulates her for being an honorable and a worthy woman. Does he fall madly in love? Well, actually, no. He says, there's someone else who actually is a bit uh, more valuable for her. Uh, I'll have a word with him tomorrow and see if he wants you. The point is, he works in a network of obligations where vulnerable people can be picked up and helped. The clan, the family, the tribe, call it what you will, recognises that others are its own responsibility. Again, the nation that looks to God will behave in a certain way to those who are also God's people. And this will be seen here in support for a vulnerable woman and her mother-in-law. Maybe the editor of Ruth needed to make this point in their own day and age. If the bonds were weakening, if people were left to their own devices, if there was no one to help them, maybe this is a wake-up call, a lesson from history. We live in times where, particularly in our own Western society, there is a shift in the friendship circles and family networks. There is a strain on the traditional methods and mechanisms of support so that people can fall through and even in their vulnerability find no help and support. We remember that these mechanisms, these support networks did not appear by magic, they were worked at. They were created, they were nurtured, they were valued for what they delivered. And so we ask now, where is the safety net? It's often said that Gandhi commented that the true measure of any society can be found in how it treats its most vulnerable members. Actually, Gandhi didn't say that, but the force of it still stands. It's most vulnerable members and how are they treated? How does our society measure up to that sort of analysis? I was reading in the paper yesterday uh, two things that, I mean, lots of things catch your eye, don't they? But two things in particular, two news items. One was in the sports pages. And in the sports pages, the reporter said that the Premier League in this summer had spent £1.7 billion acquiring players for their teams. And in the social commentary section, it pointed out that her mother was saying that in the winter she would have to spend more time out of her house because she could not afford to heat it for her family. We live in a time of extremes. I'm sure we will have all absorbed the utilities hike that has been announced. But it does not hit everybody in the same way. 
For some, it will be but a small scratch in their earnings and their resources. For others, it will threaten to wipe out their bank accounts and erode their earnings. For some, it will mean devastation, possibly even life or death. In that situation, who has the vision of a society where there is a support network, there is care for the vulnerable? Everyone has a part to play to protect those who are weak. Reading the, uh, the passage from, um, J uh, from James, it reminded me of uh, a long time ago, and again, you may have seen this, the, the cartoonist Charles Schultz, the Peanuts cartoons. And in one of them, um, Charlie Brown and Linus are out in the snow, and, and they are covered, they are the heads of uh, balaclava hats, they've got big, thick coats on, and they walk past Snoopy the dog, who is by his kennel, shivering in the cold and they say be of good cheer Snoopy yes be a good cheer and then they walk on and this was precisely the point that the writer is making in, in James James belonged to part of that tradition of the groundbreaking community of new people who found their fellowship and expression together in Jesus Christ. They came from all sorts of backgrounds, all sorts of situations, all sorts of hopes and expectations and were welded together, or at least brought together into a community. James reminds his readers, as surely they needed a reminder, that it's not enough to own the words if you can't live with the reality. It's no good saying that you understand compassion and then have no compassion for other people. It's no good saying that you see God reaches out to all, but you don't have to. These communities were beginning to find out what it means to belong together. And we read in the Old New Testament how they made their mistakes, how they found their cul-de-sacs, how they had their differences. But they were working at belonging together, under Jesus, rooted and grounded, as it says in the Ephesians, rooted and grounded on Christ to explore who they were. A community whose bases were compassion and forgiveness and acceptance and hope. We see that community not just in focused efforts and programs of outreach and care and concern, but in random acts of kindness with people we meet day by day who are in need. Because this understanding of Jesus, this rooting in God's good news, move them from just being nice people or even from being religious people who were looking for the way forward to those who created value for those who had none. For those who began to find an identity together that was different. For those who could model living well together. And this allowed human flourishing under God. So James exhorts his readers to put it into praxis, to take your theology and make it real in the lives of those around you, to be concerned for those who are less fortunate, who are more vulnerable, who needed help. Some years ago, I remember um, tutor at Spurgeon's College, not so far from here, uh, frightening, or saying he frightened his students by saying he could sum up the entire Christian gospel and um, discipleship in four words. I learned later this wasn't quite so original, but it was really striking at the time. And the four words were this, if God, then what? If there is God who reaches out to us, what does it mean? Theology and practice brought together. Now we cannot simply transfer the stories of ancient Israel or indeed of Asia Minor in the early Christian era into our societies today. 
life is more complex, life is different, life has always moved on. But as Christians, we are required to explore and understand the world in which we live in the light of God. We hold the mirror first to ourselves as Christian communities and ask, how are we doing? How do we measure up? And then hold that mirror to the wider society. What does it mean to live together as a community, as a nation, as a community of nations? Each generation, the church is called to practice what it preaches so that it might preach authentically. In these days when maybe many challenge the relevance of the church and we have a declining influence, nonetheless, the call is there to represent God as best we can through our communities and to our world. Reading the story of Ruth, and I invite you to go and read the whole story. Reading the story of Ruth and the issues that are woven around it, a romance of boy meets girl, bring out a message for us today, a message of how to cope with difference, a message of how to deal with those who have been marginalised, a message of what do we do with those who are vulnerable. Thanks be to God, for he's an expressible gift to us in Jesus Christ our Lord. We take a moment of quiet to reflect together. We respond as we sing a hymn of commitment. Jesus Christ is waiting, waiting in the streets.
some of our prayers of intercession this morning uh, are taken from Janet Murley's book, All Desires Known. Let us pray. Lord, we offer you what is in our hearts today, all that we feel, all that we can own, all that we desire for our world. We long for peace, an end to violence, for truth, for healthy, safe societies. We long for peace, joy and justice, for all to feel that they belong somewhere and that they belong to someone. We pray for these things. Our loving God, we are here because we are hungry for all that you offer, for a taste of the truth, that all is not hopeless, that we are not helpless, that the powers of this world and the rules of the market will yield to your rule. Let your kingdom come. Let us proclaim our commitment to live not under the rule of evil, but under the reign of God. We will not live under the rule of evil, where some children die for lack of proper food. We will live by your kingdom, where you are preparing on this earth a feast for all the poor, for yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory. We will not live under the rule of evil, where some are trapped by debt in desperate poverty. We will live by your kingdom. We will not live under the rule of evil, which lays heavy burdens on those who cannot bear them and lifts not a finger to help. We will live by your kingdom where all who find release will long for others to be free too. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. God, our Redeemer, you have promised liberation for our world, remission of debts, forgiveness of sins. Deliver us body, mind and spirit from the grip of all that is evil and may we who claim the blessing of release have courage to live by it in the name of him who died to set us free Jesus Christ our Lord Amen So a hymn as we prepare to go our separate ways, a hymn of affirmation, Lord, as we rise to leave this shell of worship.
Our service is ended, our worship continues. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us this day and forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.